Hello everyone, I'm Bart van Haarlem, I'm a captain on the 787 Dreamliner from TUI. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Christophersus, Patrick Amelaan and Zeb Habrake. And together with our crew and passengers, we're going to fly to Curaçao via St. Martin in the Dutch Caribbean. So we've brought up the dispatch for our flight. I'll bring it page wide. The first sector, Amsterdam, St. Martin, with 263 passengers. There is four tons cargo on this flight plan. We have a newer flight plan with 2,885 kilos of cargo. Okay. Top Hotel Tango Foxwood Mike, with 1.2% fuel bias. There's one mail item, the forward cargo cooling compressor. Sure which we know of already. We have a flight time of nine hours and five minutes to St. Martin. Contingency fuel with an en route alternate of Bermuda. Our first alternate is St. John's in the Caribbean, which gives us a minimum takeoff fuel of 50 tons and 662 kilograms. There will be tankering fuel 11 tons, no less. Gives a plant fuel of uh, nearly 62 tons. Right. And that leaves us with an estimated landing weight of 165 tons. So that's good. Excellent. Right? Yep. Then let's see what weather and no terms I'm going to bring. Uh, company notices. This is uh, old, this is old, this is old, this is known as well, this is old. The new call sign, have you, have you flown with the new call sign? Yes, I have. Yeah, okay. Of course. And this is not applicable for the flight out. This is not applicable today as well, either. Um, this is applicable. We have the higher passenger weights for the flight to Curacao. And we have the handling phone number and frequency for St. Martin, Curacao, Aruba and Bonaire. Good, thanks. Okay. Forecast Amsterdam. From 600 until 1200 tomorrow, with a wind of 280, 21 gusting 33. Visibility is more than 10 kilometers, scattered at 2000 feet, broken at 4000 feet. And the wind is becoming 250 at 17, which is nice. They're using runway 24 for departure. Becoming after nine Zulu, which is after our departure, the wind will shift a little bit to 220, strength 18, gusting 28, which is also nice because in the gust, the direction will increase and it will turn into the runway as well. Then our destination, St. Martin, forecast from 1330 Zulu, the wind is 110 at 10 knots, which is uh, into the runway. Visibility is more than six statute miles. Clouds are fewer, 2,500, and scattered at 5,000. And the next change is after 2330, will be long gone by then. So that's nice. Our destination for our alternate for St. Martin is St. John's. Weather for St. John's is wind east with 10 knots. Visibility more than 10 kilometers, scattered 1800 feet, and that's nice. And our second destination, Curacao, wind is 110 at 11, visibility is more than 10 kilometers, and clouds are scattered at 2000 feet. Okay. Then our second destination, alternate. Bonaire. And Aruba and Bonaire, we have wind 060 at 14. 
10 kilometers and scattered at 2,000 feet. And Aruba 080 at 16. So that's all nice. Yeah, all checked. Then let's have a look at our ETOPS alternates. Shannon, Stephenville, and Bermuda. Um, Shannon, 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 with a window of 1148 until 1600. Which is here, becoming between 6 and 9, 240 at 22, gusting 35. And visibility more than 10, clouds few at 1500, broken at 2800. That's the general weather. Temporarily, the wind will be 250 at 26, gusting 41. And some showers and rain. Okay. Stephenville, with a window of 14.35 until 17.24. So that is this bit. Wind is 010 at 5. More than 6 statute miles, visibility overcast 2,500 feet. And from 1,500 Zulu, 030 at 10. More than 6 miles and broken at 3,000. That's nice. And the last one is Bermuda with a window of 1600 until 1912. And that is 040 at 18, more than 10 with vicinity showers and few at 3000 scattered at 4500. Okay. No showstoppers there. Nice. So the route is northerly, south of Ireland, then towards Newfoundland, towards uh, St. John's. Bermuda, and then take a southerly course to uh, St. Martin. This is 6 Zulu, 12 o'clock, okay. So, just north of Ireland there is a bit, then we cross a jet stream over Ireland at level 300, and we'll be cruising at flight level 380. Then we'll cross over to Newfoundland, where we'll cross another jet stream to moving south at level 300 as well. By then we'll be at level 400. And then we'll pick up a tailwind towards Bermuda. And then we cross this portion here with occasional CBs up to level 450. And just behind it is an area with isolated embedded CBs up to level 450. <clears throat> and our flight is planned at level 380 over the North Atlantic level 400 and from Bermuda at level 410. So we okay. may want to take some fuel for... There's, there's fuel available at St. Martin. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but if this is occasional, then... I'm guessing we're going to be descending here. But you're that's right, but you're right. It's not in the flight plan, actually. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Well, we can take some extra. Um, no, but you're right, but you're right, you're right. Uh, in the case we don't need it, we can stay at level 410. Um, and if we do need to descend to level 370, then we can uplift some fuel in St. Martin as well. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Are we happy at 55 then? Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Let's call it in. 
Do we need to see anything else here? Um, nope. No, right. We've seen it all. Yeah. Happy. Okay. Can I call for the numbers? Yeah, please. We're off. Hey. Looks like it's a lot better here there than uh, it is here in Amsterdam. So it's windy and raining here. And it's sunny hey. and uh, with a nice and light breeze in the Caribbean. So let's go. So we are now in the flight deck and uh, we have uh, split up the three sectors we have to fly in this rotation uh, as follows. Patrick is going to do the takeoff here in Amsterdam. I myself will do the landing and the takeoff in St. Martin because that is mandatory. The captain has to do the takeoff in St. Martin and the landing there as well. Um, and then Patrick will do the landing in Curaçao again. And Zap will fly the return sector from Curaçao to Amsterdam. We've already started boarding, fueling is complete, and Patrick is uh, loading the FMC, and I'm busy loading the electronic flight back here on my left-hand side with the rotor flight. Um, that electronic flight back is used as a moving map and also stores our uh, airfield plates that are taken from Lido. It's quite a nice, nice feature. The charts are in color, and as it is connected to the GPS on board, uh, like I said before, it is a moving map system. With the CDU, we can request an auto initialization, and then via ACARS, the route will be sent to the aircraft and we can load it and accept it. Unfortunately, with the electronic flight bag, the route has to be entered manually. There is no way to quickly load the route into the electronic flight bag. Okay, so uh, I'm now going to uh, request for the uh, departure clearance, the HC clearance from uh, Schiphol. Uh, we do that by ACARS. We go to the uh, communication uh, page, show to communication, let the flight information, departure clearance request. Today's flight number is uh, Tango Fox Lima 393. Facility is Amsterdam. We're at uh, gate uh, Wolf and Niner. And we have the information uh, uniform is displaced over here. And now we can send it to uh, air traffic. The request is being sent and delivered. And now we get the clearance on this uh, screen over here. We can cancel the uh, ATIS uplink. And behind that, we get a message where the request is being processed standby. We cancel that one. And here's the departure clearance. It states uh, Amsterdam, PDC 724, Tango Fox Lima 393 is cleared to St. Martin. Uh, takeoff runway 24, via Falca 10. We received a squawk 2110. I'll put that on the uh, transponder, which you can see appear on here as well. Next frequency is uh, 11655, uh, so we can uh, confirm that we are ready for startup. The ATIS, uh, current ATIS still valid is uniform, as we received before, and we uh, can expect an intersection departure. In case of de-icing, which is not the case today, we have to contact 11.3. We can accept the clearance. Uh, normally we write the um, HC clearance on the flight plan as well, but I will wait for that uh, because Bart is still working on the uh, entering the route in Lido. So we'll do it later on, and then we can cancel the message. So we get a message that the clearance is received and confirmed by uh, air traffic control. So we've entered the squawk to 110. I've already entered uh, the expected uh, departure for today. It's on way 24. And we were cleared for a Falco One Shera, which is displaced over here. 
I'll execute it. And we can see in the plan mode on the navigation display what the routing will be for the Falco once you are at departure. Which I will brief to Bart later on. We are now starting the, uh, the APU. Um, so the aircraft will be provided with, um, with electrical. Uh, we now get uh, electrical support from ground power units, uh, which are connected on the ground with the, uh, with the aircraft. Uh, but we have a self-supporting electrical system with the, uh, with the APU. So we start the APU so we can disconnect the uh, ground power units. On the synoptic display electric page, you can see that the external power uh, sockets are powering the four main buses. Right now the APU is being started and as soon as the APU comes online it will automatically disconnect and will, the APU will then power the four electric buses. At the moment the air conditioning is being load shed because it, air conditioning is not available while we are taking electric power from the ground uh, power sources. So as soon as the APU is running we'll get a memo message in white up here stating simply APU running and then the air conditioning system will become available as well. Now here you see that the APU has come online. It is now powering the buses. The external power units are still available. They are green, but they are no longer powering the electric buses. And now the air conditioning is not, no longer loads yet. There are still some heaters that are being load shed, but the air conditioning itself uh, has come online now as well. You can hear the airflow starting to pick up now. Then I think I'm ready for the pre-flight checklist. Uh, the pre-flight checklist, oxygen. Oxygen tested 100%. Tested 100%, flight instruments. Heading 086, altimeter is 1013. Heading 086, uh, 086 altimeter 1013. Pre-flight checklist complete. I'm happy with the load sheet. Yeah, me too. Yeah, had a look at it? Yeah. Okay. Our process of uh, checking the load sheet is that we both look at the load sheet individually, um, rather than one reading it out loud to the other, because then the other one is bound to just listen and not really check what is on paper. So we check it individually, and once we are both happy with the load sheet, uh, I will call out the zero fuel weight to match that with the uh, flight management system. Zero fuel weight is 146,300 kilos. Uh, 146.3. Which is one ton less than planned on the operating flight plan. And 1,143,300. Uh, gives us a takeoff mass of 201.1. Yeah, I've got that. And I also have a CG, uh, takeoff uh, CG 25.5. Copy FMC data. Now I'll bring up the ATIS that we have received earlier. I wrote it down as well on the flight plan. To see what the wind was for our performance calculation. 250 at 14 knots. The EFB automatically copies the data from the FMC, being the actual takeoff weight, also the outside air temperature that is being sensed by the aeroplane, and the QNH that we have set into the flight instruments. Yeah, yeah. Right. I have entered Echo Hotel Alpha Mike for Amsterdam, runway 24, expecting an intersection takeoff, share of 5, runway condition dry, wind is 250 degrees, 14 knots, temperature 14 degrees C, QNH 1013, takeoff gross weight 201,397 kilograms, thrust rating optimum. We have a choice of taking a fixed D-rate or even a wind shear option, but the wind is steady at the moment, so we'll take the optimum condition. Maximum assumed. Improved climb, we take optimum here as well. 
we'll let the EUV calculate an optimum flap setting as well. The reversers are all, are all operating. Engine and the ice is off since the temperature is above 10 degrees C. The CG air limit is 23. And you have a zero fuel weight of 146,300 kilograms. And the actual center of gravity is 25.5. I've got all the same. Okay. Then I'll let the computer calculate the takeoff performance. When that's done, we'll check it between the left and the right e uh, electronic flight pack. And after that, we'll send it to the FMC. In the meanwhile, I can do a briefing. Yeah, I'm happy. happy? Yeah. Okay, the aircraft status. Aircraft status. We have a left forward cargo air conditioning compressor that is unserviceable. It's also on the status page. And we have a captain's head-up display that is inoperative. Check. Your head-up display is working, and we may expect a status message for the captain's head-up display as well. Yeah, check. Uh, the aircraft is uh, signed for ETOPS, check? It is ETOPS checked and signed, yep. Okay. Uh, the NOTOMS for Amsterdam. Uh, we've discussed them already in the uh, crew room. Um, main things are that there is some uh, taxiways are closed between uh, Alpha 12 and Papa 3. Yep. Um, and the minimums for 27 in case of landing are 242 for uh, category D. Um, landing runway at this moment is uh, 18 right, so uh, 27 is not, uh, not used at this moment. Uh, the weather is, uh, is actually quite good. The wind has uh, ceased a bit. It's steady, 250 with uh, 14 at the moment. Um, and we have an HC clearance for takeoff runway 24. Uh, fuel is uh, 55.1 is loaded in the aircraft at the moment. And we've uh, ordered 55.0 tons of fuel. Um, the briefing itself. Uh, we are parked at Golf Niner. Uh, what do you expect for the uh, taxi routing towards uh, Sierra 5 runway 24? Well, there is a note time that taxiway Alpha is closed between uh, stand Papa 3 and Alpha 1 2. So I expect us to taxi out from Golf 9 on the Alpha track eastbound, and then at Alpha 1 3 we'll take a right, and I'm expecting a left turn then again on Alpha 1 2 and then pick up Alpha again. Either that, or we will transition to the Bravo taxiway. And then onwards to Alpha, uh, Alpha 7 and then take Sierra 6. The performance will be done for Sierra 5, but Sierra 6 and Sierra 5 will come, uh, will have the same takeoff position. Check. Okay, then the takeoff from uh, runway 24 is a Falcon 1 Sierra departure. If you can display the uh, map display and the leg space on the CDU. I have on the legs page. Uh, Sunbound 1. I just copied the uh, Lido information. Falcon 1 Sierra. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Runway heading 238 for 3 miles onto Waypoint Echo Hotel 001. Then track 224 to Waypoint Echo Hotel 051. Another 3 miles. And then track 251 for 4 miles to Echo Hotel 009 with an altitude restriction of 2,500 feet or above. And then we'll continue track 251 to Waypoint Valco, and we'll stop the climb at flight level 60. Yeah, that's all copied. It's all the same in the Lido charts. Um, minimum safe altitude at Amsterdam is uh, 1,700 in departure area. Uh, actually, 2,300. And for the arriving, if we return back to Amsterdam, 1-8 ride, 1,700. Uh, transition altitude is 3,000. Um, any specials or threats for today? Um, no, it's a bit, uh, it's windy, uh, it's steady now, but uh, that may change. Uh, it's a bit cloudy, although it's clearing up, but uh, should that runway appear to be wet, then we may have to re redo the takeoff performance calculation. Uh, one thing that I missed in the briefing is the non-normals. Okay. Uh, before 18 knots, we stop for any no function. Um, between AT and V1, we stop for which items? We'll stop for an engine failure, engine fire or fire warning, any fire or fire warning, 
if the aircraft is clearly unable or unsafe to fly or the predictive wind shear warning. In case of an RTO, I will check the uh, maximum braking and that the speed brake goes up and if we have full reverse as normal. Uh, after V1, there is no engine out procedure, so we continue straight ahead, accelerating at uh, 1,000 feet. And I would like to suggest to climb to 4,000 and we can uh, take it from there. Okay, that will turn out to be flight level 40 then. 40, okay. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Any questions? No. Okay. Clear. Mijn naam is Bart van Haarlem. Ik ben nu gezagvoerder op deze reis van Amsterdam naar Sint Maarten. En daarna gaan we door naar Curaçao. Ik word vandaag in de cockpit bijgestaan door twee collega's. Eerste officieren Patrick Ammerlaan en Zeb Habraken. En in de cabine bent u in uitstekende handen van onze collega's onder leiding van uw purser Patricia Bijsberg. En met z'n allen gaan we er ons best voor doen om er een fijne reis van te maken. We gaan zo de deuren sluiten. We vragen toestemming om de motoren te starten en dan taxieren uit naar de startbaan. Dat is de kaagbaan. Dat betekent dat we gaan opstijgen in een zuidwestelijke richting. Zoveel mogelijk tegen de wind in. Daarna hebben we wat licht bochtenwerk nodig om onze route te onderscheppen. En die brengt ons initieel over de Noordzee richting Londen. En als we op onze eerste vliegroot zijn aangekomen, dan kom ik nog even bij u terug. En dan legt ik of mijn collega's kom nog even bij u terug en dan leggen we uit hoe de route vandaag loopt naar onze eerste bestemming vandaag, Zit Maarten. De geplande vliegtijd vandaag is 9 uur en 8 minuten. Ik wens u alvast een heel aangename reis. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. And also from the Flight Deck, a warm welcome aboard this Boeing 787 Dreamliner from TUI. My name is Bart van Haarlem. I'm your captain on this flight from Amsterdam to St. Martin. And thereafter onwards to Curaçao. I'm joined in the Flight Deck today by my colleagues, First Officers Patrick Amelan and Zeb Habraken. And in the cabin, you're in the excellent hands of our colleagues, under command of your purser, Patricia Beiersberger. And the entire team is going to do its best to make this a pleasurable flight today. We're about to close the entry doors. We'll be asking permission to start the engines shortly, and then we'll be on our way. Takeoff runway will be towards the southwest, into the wind. After departure, we'll need some uh, slight turns to pick up our departure route of flight, and that will initially take us across the North Sea towards London, UK. As soon as we reach our first cruising altitude, I myself or one of my colleagues will come back to you and will explain the route to our first destination, St. Martin. The flight time today is nine hours and eight minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please bear with us a few more moments, and I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant flight. Thank you for your attention. Orange 3, 9 3, Golf 9 is ready. Orange 3, 9 3, goedemorgen. Can you accept the section Sierra 6? Affirmative, Orange 3, 9 3. Orange 3, 9 3, the QNH 1013, with information Victor, contact 1 to 1 SML8. What's 1 8? Information Victor 1013, Orange 3, 9 3. Yes, please, Alpha Taxiway and Ida 20. Thank you, sir. One two six three for taxi. One two six three taxi two runway. Before star checkers, business signs on the MCP. V two is one six one. Heading is two thirty eight and altitude level six zero. The takeoff speeds V one one five five, V rotate one five six, and V two one six one. The CDU pre flight completed. Taxi takeoff briefing completed. Before start checklist complete. Yeah. Two five. Thank you. Right. Six zero three request taxi. Denmark six zero three taxi to runway two four Shara six. Then by frequency one two one decimal seven. Two four zero six. Then by one two one seven. Shara six zero three. Good day. Uh, ready for departure. Traction zero zero eight Quebec. Continue for Golf One, but hold short of the runway in Mount traffic. Continue Golf One, hold short of the runway. Traction zero zero eight Quebec. Ground point. Take aviation uh, two one four. Runway two two Quebec. Take aviation two one four. Hello. Taxi two Golf Lima. Via taxi way Golf. Taxi two Golf Lima. Via taxi way Golf uh, two one four. Kelly 1845, fully ready, able Echo 5. Now, not more, Echo here. Echo 5, then for you, please. 
Echo 5 en uh, ja, die kerel maar even vaak, dankjewel. Easy 8 1 Yankee Romeo, approaching Alpha 13, give way to the KLM 737 coming up from the right. And for you then to enter the apron Alpha 13 and Levi Alpha 12. Ok, give way to the uh, 73 from the right and into Alpha 13 and out by Alpha 12. We see 8 1 Yankee Romeo. KLM 282, first left on Bravo. Good morning, United uh, 20, NCD apron and Alpha 13. Say again, uh, Alpha 13 transition. Correct, right, sir. Roger, Alpha 13 to Bravo, United uh, 20. Get him on 845, give way to the company 73, left to right for November 2. For you, Echo 5 well, to hold short and the tower 119 at a small 225. Echo 5, uh, 92 to 8. Get Charlie, the tower 119 at a small 225. 119 at 225, get him on Charlie. Round one, sir. Three, nine, three, ready. Easy one for Romeo Charlie, taxi runway two four, Sierra six. Two four, Sierra six. Uh, easy uh, one for Romeo Charlie, Roger. Round one, street nine, three, gold nine, ready for start of push. Alpha one three, a right turn to enter the apron, sir. No right. Enter the apron, right? Enter your uh, United States. Take the number. Yeah. KLM two eight two, on Bravo, hold short of Alpha one nine or one eight, whatever you prefer for the bridge. Uh, okay, uh, hold short of Alpha one nine or. Alpha 1-8, we gaan even kijken. Ja, Fox 5 gate, still spite, company traffic. Oh, jammer. Oké. Okay. Round 1 is 393, volg 9 en ik ben 6 naar de push. Orange 393, stand by, outbound traffic. Stand by, orange 393. Kelemon 263, contact tower, 119 decimal 225. 119 to the 5, 1 to 6, 3, doei. Correction 008, Quebec, hold short and contact tower, 119 decimal 225. Okay, Grant, uh, this is Flight Deck. We are clear for push and start brakes are set to park. Okay, sure. Please, please. please. Parking brake is released. Okay, the brake was off. Push back now. And both engines starting. Okay, starting both engines simultaneously. Okay. Yeah, let me clear them. Okay. Start the right engine. All right here. Starting right. And start the left engine. Long stations. Whereas normally on other airplanes the engine just started with air to rotate the uh, N2. Here, however, the engines are started electrically, the generators are used as starter motors as well. Now the APU is providing power to the main buses and the electrical system is now powering the variable frequency starter generators. There are two fitted to each engine, to each engine so we have four starter generators. What you see here is that several systems are being load shed electrically because a lot of power is needed to start both engines at the same time. The auto start system automatically decides when to introduce the fuel and the, igni and the igniters and if the start should fail it will cut the fuel and then re-attempt it for three times before uh, stopping the engine start altogether. Ground loader, set back back, please. Brakes are set to park. Check. Now the engines are running and the starters have become generators now. Less systems are being load shed and the APU has now been switched off. Okay, ground, we have two good starts. You may disconnect and we'll see you on the right hand side with the all clear signal. Have a good day.
Control check. It's not necessary to bring up the flight control synoptic page during the flight control check. The system auto, it does its own self-test of all the flight controls. This flight control check is simply a check of freedom of movement. Check spin. Yeah, that's all checked. So it's basically to see if my arms can reach full down elevator and if my belly is not in the way for full up elevator. Feet on the pedals for the rudder check. Rudder full left, center and full right. The before taxi checklist. The before taxi checklist, NTIs, photo, recall. It's checked. Checked. Flight yeah. controls. Cargo AC forward was uh, a mail item in the book, yeah. Check. Flight uh, controls are checked. And the ground equipment? It's clear. It's clear. Before taxi checklist. Okay. Orange 393, request Orange 393, taxi Sierra 6, runway 24. Taxi Sierra 6, runway 24, orange 393. Camera 6, Sierra Echo, with Left is clear. Left is clear. Left is clear. Left is clear. Right on Alpha, and right is clear. Check. Left is clear as well. for the before take of checklist. The before take of checklist complete. Checklist complete. Adria 7174, are you ready for departure? Hey Tom, Adria 7174. Perfect, come with the tower, Mama 9, there's a Mama 9, good day. Mama 9, there's a Mama 9, good day, Adria 7174. Orange 3 and 3, continue to Sierra 6, the uh, Fokker 100 on taxiway, Bravo, no conflict. Come with the tower, Bama 9, this is Bama 9, good day. Two, four, 
Okay, she's on the brakes. You have control. I have control. Take off. Runway 24 is confirmed. Back at a moment, Bravo. Hold, sir. Hold, sir. Hold, sir. Hold, Bravo. Thrust is set. Nine knots. Echo five to make two three zero degrees. Right, you're up. Trust round. Trust round, be speed. Trust. Delta 179, wind 240 degrees, 13 knots, cost 20, runway 24, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, runway 24, Delta 179. Orange 393, hello, Class Battle 4130. Class Battle 130, Orange 393. Departure, Kilo 315, Passing 2300, Lego 3 Echo. Kilo 315, Class Battle 4130. After take of checklist. After take of checklist. After take of checklist. Adria 7174, contact Amsterdam 134, small 375. 134, Orange 75, Adria Departure Delta 179 with the other two for flight level 60. Delta 179, hello, class level 130. Flight level 130, Delta 179. Orange 393, contact Amsterdam 125, decimal 750. Amsterdam 125, decimal 75. Orange 393. Level 002, descent flight level 120. Level 120 now, level 1002. Amsterdam, Orange, 393, climb level 130. Orange, 393, good up, climb flight level 190. Climb flight level 190, Orange, 393. Level 002, fly the arrival, owner of the Shadow Fugle Inbound, Sugar, 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 Level 110, Orange 393, Cloud Fadable 220. Cloud Fadable 220, Orange 393. Search it out the 179 with the other 10-7 for 130. Fadable 220 is set. Check. So this is the Lido departure plate for the Valco 1 Sherry departure we had from runway 24 in Amsterdam. We've cross-checked that with the departure that was selected from the CDU that is linked to ALNAV, that is controlling the flight director and the autopilot. Uh, needless to say that they have to, to match, obviously. So during the briefing, one of us will check what's on the plate, while the other will check what is in the flight management system. Now we have entered the en route phase, we can bring up the route chart. Zoom in.
And this is a global map, so it's a, it's a lot of data it has to process. So zooming sometimes take a bit, can take a while. Depending on the mode of the chart, you can pan along the route. And you can also keep the present aircraft position centered on the chart. And as it is connected to the GPS, this little round symbol, or nearly round symbol, it's almost a bit of a Pac-Man, indicates the aircraft's position. Thrust rev, VNAV speed. Check, flight of 3807. At 380 is checked. We are the Pac-Man symbol, which is not a full round donut, because in navigation uh, uh, pictograms, a round circle is the estimated position on a chart. And the intention is that these moving maps are meant for reference, and they're meant for navigational purposes in terms of where you can reference the content of the chart, but the aircraft symbol that is, although it's it's a quite quite a good fix and it is connected to the GPS, it's not certified and meant to navigate on, on that symbol alone. And therefore they have changed the round circle into a small uh, Pac-Man-like symbol, which is uh, a circle with a with a notch taken out of it. We are now zoomed in uh, to the maximum level and you can see the map slowly moving under us. And you can unlock it from the present position and then you can move the map around wherever you like. And it's a great tool to have. You no longer ha have the need for paper maps where the information you need is always on the fold, which uh, on many occasions is torn. Here you always have a crisp map and with digital updates, it's easy to update the system. It's easy to update the approach charts. Um, so you'll, you'll hardly ever find yourself flying around with outdated charts and maps. A very nice system to have. And lately, Lido has also incorporated airport moving map, which allows us to um, have an improved image of the airport layout, which we can use during taxiing. And again, this also is not meant to navigate upon, to navigate on during taxiing, but it does help us to create a better situational awareness on the airport. It's much like the airport moving map, which we, you can uh, find on the navigation display on board the aircraft. Um, it's just another layout, and on this system we can assign a gate number we have been assigned to. If we enter a gate number, it will always tell us where on this chart the gate is where we are taxiing to. So if we return to Amsterdam tomorrow, you'll find that um, even if the gate is not in view, it will always tell us which direction it, it, uh, it can be found. In this system, we have programmed a few airports on the clip. We have our field of origin, Amsterdam. Our destination is on here already. And we have our three ETOPS en route alternates programmed here as well, being Shannon, Stephenville, and Bermuda. So this is the general air facility chart for our first ETOPS alternate Shannon, which is readily available, and uh, ground charts and approach charts and arrival charts can be easily selected. So even when you're diverting to a field, um, or if you're diverting to a field that was not initially planned, 
say if we were uh, in need to divert to London Heathrow at this moment, we could easily bring up the charts. Um, it's a lot easier than with the old system where you're working with massive volumes of paper charts. So before departure we received we received an an IFR clearance, an airway clearance. But since a part of our flight is over the North Atlantic, we'll be flying in oceanic airspace, as it is called. And for oceanic airspace we need a separate clearance. It depends on the area where you enter the uh, North Atlantic airspace. We are going to enter North Atlantic airspace in the Shenwick controlled area. So we're going to ask an oceanic clearance from Shenwick. This is the identifier for Shenwick control. And we'll enter the North Atlantic airspace over position Tobor. As it is part of our flight plan route, the estimated time of arrival is automatically propagated into this page. All we have to enter now is our requested flight level and also our requested Mach number. Happy. Yep. Sending. On the left of the uh, primary flight display, this is called the auxiliary display. And here the air traffic control data link messages are presented, as well as um, uh, HS messages that come in. And this message simply states that they have received our oceanic clearance request. And we have to wait 15 minutes. If we don't receive an answer in 15 minutes, we need to call them by a uh, radio frequency by voice. Happy to cancel, Patrick. Happy. Okay. So we have an ATC message that came in stating our oceanic clearance. Okay. Now, the easiest thing is to read it out loud, but to be honest, our normal way to work around with this is that each pilot reached the uh, clearance out himself. We both have the clearance on our own auxiliary display. Um, so we'll both read it silently to see if we want to accept this clearance or not. Yeah, it also says here in plain English that the that there is a change of route in this clearance. It's slightly different from what we have requested. The entry point is different than the coordinates at 20 west and 30 west are as filed. And then it's a bit lower at 40 west and 50 west and the exit is different as well. Just before we accept this route, we 
Shannon, hello, Orange uh, 3, on a 3, maintaining flight level 380. Tango Fox, Lima 393, Shannon, good day, identified. So this is our RETOPS verification chart. These circles indicate the 180 minute ETOPS circles around our uh, ETOPS alternates. And as you can clearly see, one degree lower in root coordinates is not going to bring us outside these circles. So I'd say we can easily accept this route. Yeah. Are you happy? Yep. Okay. So we are accepting the route. And once that, now it is accepted, are you happy to cancel it? Um, I'll bring it up again in the, on yeah. the comp page, okay? okay. Yep. So we'll look into this in a moment, because it is a change of route, but for now I'm going to cancel it, because there might be another message behind it. I see that there is another ATC um, indication on ICAS, so I'm going to cancel this message to see if there is something else behind it, and there is simply indicating that the clearance has been confirmed by us. Are you happy to cancel this one? Yes, sir. So my oceanic clearance is different from the flight plan route and from the requested route, but now I have cancelled it and I have to bring it back to adjust the route in the FMC accordingly. So we look up the oceanic clearance. Oh. Thank you. Can you ask him uh, if we can proceed direct to Limbury? Yeah, we'll do. Shannon Orange 393, any chance to proceed direct to Limerick? Orange 393, A firm, cleared now direct Limerick. Cleared direct Limerick, Orange 393. So we'll place Limerick on top. Yep, yeah, check. Executing. So we have changed our active route from our original entry point Tobo to Limri. Now we're going to have to adjust the FMC routing according to our oceanic clearance. Next waypoint is 53 north 020 west. Next after that is 53 north 030 west. And here is another change, 50 north, 40 west. The next is going to be 46 north, 50 west, which is also different from the original 50 west coordinate. And the next one is Sapri. Okay. So from Limri to 53 North 20 West, where we pick up the original flight plan route until 30 West, and then we'll drop down a degree to 50 North 40 West, 56 North 50 West, and then to Supri, which is just south of Relic. So what I'll do is I'll bring up the next waypoint after Relic, or I'll just place Relic under Supri, which leaves a discontinuity in a moment. So we have to get a connection from Supri to the 
rest of the route. I'll have a look into the chart, see what uh, connects with it, but I think I'm expecting Subri direct 3 9 north 6 0 west. And Relic direct 3 9 north 6 0 west is going to change into Subri direct 3 9 north 6 0 west. We just need confirmation after that. Are you happy if I connect the two in yeah. the Lex page? Go ahead. Subri followed by 390 North 60 West. Check. Okay. Now the clearance also states that we have to be at Limri, maintaining level 400, mark decimal 84. So first we'll enter mark decimal 84 with flight level 400 at Limri. Yep. And the FMC will automatically transition from econ speed to a fixed Mach number, mark decimal 84, as we pass Limri. And since this is a slight change from our flight plan route, I will also print a copy of it. I've entered the new route in the uh, Lido routing, so you can copy the route. So it's a bit of a pity that the electronic flight back, the navigation portion of it, doesn't talk to the FMC, that you cannot download and upload routes from the FMC into the EFB and vice versa. But fortunately, you can, uh, they do cross-talk between the left EFB and the right EFB, so if you change your route in the left one, you don't also have to change it in the right one, you can easily copy the route from the other EFB. And here is the printed oceanic clearance. The route we have across the Atlantic is a random route. There are also some designated routes today that connect the European route structure with the North American route structure. And they are oceanic tracks, North Atlantic organized track system tracks, OTS tracks, and they are um, created on a daily basis, twice a day, every day, westbound tracks and eastbound tracks are being uh, plotted to connect both route structures. And these tracks differ daily depending on the most favorable wind, or least unfavorable wind. Our route stays clear of the most southerly track of all the organized tracks. We will, however, plot the nearest track into the system should we need to divert. Um, then we'll know where the nearest track is to avoid other traffic, because these tracks are usually highly uh, populated by air traffic. Also, during our uh, as a part of our navigation procedures, we, as a pre-flight um, action, we check the tracks and distances between the oceanic waypoints, and now the route has changed. We have to, again, check the tracks and distances for the new route uh, that we have been issued by our oceanic clearance. The formal way for us to, to verify tracks and distances are to look them up in our Lido documentation, but there are some limitations to Lido documentation. It also gives us tracks between uh, 10 degree longitude waypoints. And 
other waypoints such as Limri and Super are not in those tables. Um, and apart from that, it is quite it is quite a, uh, a chore to look them up in the tables. Fortunately, someone designed an app for that, and that makes life a lot easier. Whether you use the the uh, navigation documentation tables or an app, they're all true tracks and distances, whereas these tracks are magnetic tracks. So if you want to check the tracks to the tables, we have to make sure we select the heading reference to True North, so we can check, verify true tracks in the FMC with true tracks that are, that are being calculated between the waypoints. From Limri to 53 North, 20 West, I have a track of 290 degrees and a distance of 192 nautical miles. Uh, 192. Oh, yeah, that's correct. To position 53 North, 30 West, 274 with a distance of 361 nautical miles. Yeah. To 50 North, 40 West. The track is 248 and the distance is 414 nautical miles. Yeah. To position 46 North, 50 West. I have a track of 243 degrees and four, distant 467 nautical miles. And to position Sapri, 251 degrees at 89 nautical miles. We've requested our oceanic clearance via ACARS and there is another part of a data link system which requires a logon now we have various data link um, sources one is, one is over VHF and the center radio is used for data over VHF On HF, the right radio is used for data, and if that fails, we still have a SATCOM, which also has a link established. So we have a properly working uh, data connection, now we have to log on to the air traffic control center of Shanwick, our first oceanic and uh, air traffic control. We'll go to the logon page and again we will enter the identifier for Shanwick. And here it indicates that the network is ready. Now before before I press send we have a look into the manager to make sure that ADS emergency is not inadvertently selected on. Emergency is off and ADS is armed. So now we will send a logon request and after that logon is successful we'll have an active data link contract with Shanwick Oceanic Control Center. And what that buys us is that the aircraft will automatically send position reports every time we will pass an oceanic waypoint such as Limbri or 53 North, 20 West. But also it will allow air traffic control to retrieve our position. They can send a, re a position request to the aircraft and retrieve a position report from the aircraft any moment they desire. Also, should we deviate from our route of flight, the airplane will automatically tell on us.
Now this is indeed a two-engine aircraft and uh, as we are flying over the North Atlantic where uh, alternate airports are scarce, we have to have an ETOPS certification and this aircraft has a, a three-hour or a 180-minute ETOPS certification. The implications are that the airplane has to be maintained according to an ETOPS standard. It has to be pre-flight checked according to an ETOPS standard. Uh, that is what we verify as a flight crew in the aircraft uh, flight technical log. And also we, uh, in the dispatch phase, in the flight planning phase, uh, a number of ETOPS alternates have to be selected. Alternates that are, um, well, the old-fashioned terms were suitable adequate and suitable airplane airfields where we can navigate to and where the weather conditions are such that we can also fly into these airfields. So during the dispatch in the crew room we have looked into the NOTAMs and weather information for these alternates and now we will program the alternates into the fixed pages so we can easily find our position in relation to these ETOPS alternates. Our first alternate is in Ireland, Shannon. And we'll be entering ETOPS when we navigate more than one hour's flying distance away from our first ETOPS alternate. And this uh, green circle here indicates a 400 nautical mile circle. Um, 400 nautical miles is our one hour still air flying distance. That means that if we have a three hour ETOPS uh, approval, we have to stay within 1200 nautical miles from Shannon. Our next ETOPS alternate is Stephenville. Stephenville and Newfoundland. And we also have to stay within 1,200 nautical miles from Stephenville. And our last ETOPS alternate is Bermuda. And if I zoom out, I have Shannon as my first ETOPS alternate with a one hour circle and a three hour circle. And this is the three hour circle for our second ETOPS alternate, Stephenville. And on the top, you'll see a portion of the ETOPS, three hour ETOPS circle of our last ETOPS alternate, Bermuda. And when we look in the plan mode, it looks a bit like this. The route is well within our three hour circles. We are nowhere on our route getting anywhere near our limits of the area of operation. Um, so in terms of ETOPS planning and execution, this is a relatively um, easy flight with no hard decisions so far. So we are connected through CPDLC with Shenwick and now we are passing 30 west. We have just had a digital handover to Gander. We are now in CPDLC contact with Gander. And in a minute we're going to call them on HF. This is a reminder that we have programmed to contact Gander while after passing uh, 30 west. Um, before we had CPDLC in the aircraft, we had to rely on VHF uh, radio contact over land and HF radio contact over water. Uh, VHF uh, 
only works through line of sight, so that is only applicable until the horizon. Uh, VHF contact is, is not possible uh, behind the horizon. HF, however, HF radio signals follow the curvature of the Earth. They also uh, reflect to layers above our atmosphere and then back to the uh, Earth's surface and then back to into the Earth at Earth's atmosphere again. HF radio signals can go halfway around the globe. So that is a perfect way to have to maintain radio contact over great distances. We are now listening out on a VHF radio channel, which is a, a general communication channel and obviously the international guard frequency. Um, but there is no transmission on neither of these bands and you hear nothing. When I select a HF radio, you will hear something. You will hear quite a lot of static. Radio Delta 235 with Between the transmissions, you hear a lot of static on HF radio because you cannot squelch away the static. It is, uh, you can adjust the squelch by reducing the HF sensitivity, but it is hardly possible to completely remove it. And it, it comes at a cost, and the cost is that you will have a lesser reception of the HF transmission you're looking for. I'm going to call Gander, and then I'm going to ask him to do a cell call check, which is actually a type of radio doorbell. Gander Radio, Orange 393 on HF 88. I'll tell them which frequency I use because these controllers usually cover several radio frequencies. Orange 393, Gander, go ahead. Orange 393, we are CPDLC and our exit point is Supri. Request a cell call check on Hotel Lima Echo Romeo. Orange 393, copy C, video C, exit at Super, call call, tell me my phone, Romeo. So cell call is indicated here on the screen. Standard, thank you, that was a very good cell call. And uh, confirm the secondary frequency is 11279er. Scan the red. That is yeah. Orange 373, Roger. 393, Roger. So now I can deselect this radio again, and that way I don't have to listen to static all day long. We have just tested the cell call, which is, like I said, basically a radio doorbell. If ATC needs to talk to us on the radio, they will select a cell call code, which is a aircraft-specific four-letter code, and they'll send an extra uh, audio tone on the radio, which is picked up by our aircraft, and that will generate a doorbell, a ping, and the word cell call. And that is to indicate to us that ATC wants to talk to us on the radio. So despite our digital link we have with the Air Traffic Control Center of Gander now, we still have a backup system, which is our old-fashioned HF radio, with a cell call system to attract our attention should they need it. It is, a, it is indeed a beautiful plane. Um, myself, Patrick and Zeb, we have all three transitioned from the 767. That was a nice plane, but a completely um, different generation of aeroplane. Um, it did have some screens not only dials uh, for instruments, but some instruments were quite conventional. In this flight deck, which is very much uh, a glass cockpit, um, almost everything is digital digitalized. The only thing that is really conventional is our old-fashioned compass, which is here in the middle. Um, 
but all the rest is made out of uh, 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 flat screens. The nice thing about flat screens is that they are interchangeable. So if, say, this screen would fail, our maintenance crew can replace it by this screen. So even if you're on an outstation and you don't have that much support, if you don't have spare parts, if you have an engineer who can change these screens over, then you have a dispatchable aeroplane. So that's one benefit. Obviously there is the benefit that there is no parallax on a digital display. That's nice. The screens are quite large. Um, we have some colleagues that have transitioned from a 737 which have quite similar um, instrumentation. Both the primary flight display and the uh, navigation display have the same symbology as on the 737 next generation. For us transitioning from the 767, it took some time to get used to because it is a lot of information that's, um, uh, that's available which you have to interpret. Um, we have also adapted uh, the Boeing way to operate this aircraft. I don't believe I've ever been as close to the Boeing standard operating procedures as we are now with the 787 and the introduction of it in our company. These screens are, uh, like I said, they are physically interchangeable and if some screen should fail there are some ways to to make some changes in flight should we have some mal uh, a malfunction of one of the screens. We can swap ICAS to the left side or to the right side. It depends on the desire of the operating crew whether we carry ICAS on the captain's side or on the first officer's side. Uh, so pilots prefer to have ICAS on their side while they are pilot flying. Um, I'm quite, uh, quite uh, ambivalent. It, I don't really mind where it goes. Personally, um, if I'm flying as a pilot flying, I would keep ICAS on my side so my pilot monitoring has still got half a screen available when he is opening a checklist. The good thing about having ICAS on the pilot flying side is that if you bring up a checklist on one side, you still have half a screen available as a navigation display, which helps in monitoring the flight path of the pilot flying. I just noticed we had a fuel low center ICAS message, which indicates that the center fuel pumps, the center fuel tank is almost empty. If we bring up the fuel synoptic display, you'll see that there is 1.9 tons in the center fuel tank. When the center fuel tank becomes uh, drops below 2,000 kilos, the ICAS brings up a. Uh, oh, I'm sorry brings up a fuel low center ICAS message, which is our prompt to switch off the center fuel pump switches. Now the center fuel pumps are being switched off. There they are. So now fuel is fed to the engines from the left and right main fuel tank. After the main fuel tank quantities drop below 16 tons respectively, the fuel system automatically will scavenge the fuel from the center tank into the left and right main tanks. So that 1,800 kilos of fuel is not gone to waste, it's still being used. So in a couple of minutes, we can come back to this screen and we'll see how the scavenge system will take these, uh, the center tank fuel and dump it into the main tanks. The other synoptic displays that we, that we have available here are the electric synoptic display, which I showed you before we started the engines.
We have four engine-driven generators, each producing 250 kilovolt amps. So all four of them all together generate approximately one million watt of electric power. A lot on this aircraft is driven electrically. Obviously the hydraulic pumps are uh, driven uh, electrically, two pumps are driven mechanically by the engines, the others are driven electrically. Um, air conditioning is done electrically. So she, she consumes a lot of electric power. At this moment in this cruise stage of flight, she will consume approximately 45-46% of the generated electricity from the four engine generators. The airplane has three external power connectors, two at the front of the airplane and one at the rear of the airplane. The third one is used for engine start without the assistance of the APU. It is possible to start this aircraft with two external power units, um, but that will take some considerable load shedding. And normally during the turnaround, we require two external powers, two external power units to properly power the airplane. The second page we've got available is the hydraulics page. And the nice thing about these pages is that they quickly give you an indication of the system status. And not only does it show graphically in what way hydraulic fluid is flowing, um, but it also shows you when systems malfunction, in what way that occurs. And if components are being load shed because of electrical problems, it will show you which comp components are being load shed on this page as well. We've just seen the fuel page. We'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes when the fuel is being scavenged from the center tank. On the air distribution page, we can see here that the aircraft is fitted with four compressors. They're called cabin air compressors. Conventional jet aircraft take their air conditioning uh, air from the compressor of the propulsion system of the engines. This aircraft does not have a bleed system that takes air from the compressors. It has dedicated compressors that take air outside air and feed it directly into the air conditioning packs. So the air that is taken in by the cabin air compressors are, comes nowhere near from any of the engines. The air conditioning pack then uh, heats the air, it also uh, dehumidifies it, which is later humidified again. Heated air and cooled air are then combined and fed into the fuselage of the aircraft at various locations, and we can control the, the temperature in uh, several compartments. The flight deck has its own temperature selector and from the fly deck we can control a master temperature for the passenger cabin which then can be uh, slightly modified by the cabin crew and they can adjust the temperature should they uh, desire in four different sections in the passenger cabin. The cargo compartments are heated and vented. The forward cargo compartment is uh, heated and fitted with a forward cargo air conditioning system and the aft cargo and the bulk cargo have a uh, heating system that we can't really control from the fly deck. We can uh, uh, control the ventilation of the bulk cargo compartment but the temperature in the aft cargo compartment is uh, kept at an average temperature.
And the remaining pages that we have available are a door synoptics page that will show the door status. It shows now that all the entry doors and service doors, entry doors on the left and service doors on the right, are uh, closed and locked and armed. What you don't see on this page at this moment are cargo doors and electronic compartment panel doors, refueling panel doors located on this side. They all they are retracted from view, but as soon as these doors are um, opened and closed, then you will see their symbols coming up on this page as well. The gear synoptic page gives us uh, tire pressures and it gives us uh, brake temperatures in a uh, unit format. So these are not absolute temperatures, but these are temperature units. This is the flight control synoptics page, and it shows the status of the flight controls, ailerons, inboards are flap runs, which is a, uh, a crossing between flaps and ailerons, and on the 787, basically for takeoff and landing, the entire leading edge of the wing droops in its entirety. It will show the um, trim indicators as well, and before takeoff, the stabilizer trim indicator will also show on the ICAST screen. This is a fly-by-wire aeroplane, which means that the control inputs from the pilots are sent to the flight control computer and they are digitally then sent to the flight control services. So even if we disengage the autopilot, then still all the manually uh, flown signals will be sent to the autopilot computer. The autopilot in the normal flight control mode, which is the, the, the regular flight control mode we operate in, all the signals that we create with our manually steering inputs are being weighed by the uh, flight control electrics and if needed they are even corrected. Having said that, it is a Boeing flight control system, a Boeing fly-by-wire system, and that means that the pilot always has the final say. If we were to make a turn with, say, too much bank, our normal operating limit in bank is 30 degrees, if we would make a steep turn at 45 degrees bank, the aeroplane will start to push back to bring us back within those 30 degrees of bank. However, if we decide we need 45 degrees of bank, we can get it. The flight control system does some other things as well. It has what is called a gust suppression system. We are now in relatively calm air, but uh, when we encounter turbulence, the flight control system tries to dampen the effect of turbulence, which is um, helping us to, which is helping the aircraft to make it feel like a smoother ride. It does not really eliminate turbulence because that's difficult to do next to impossible, but it will take away all the sharp edges of turbulence. And that's of great benefit to passengers who are very prone to air sickness. And the last two pages on this screen are not really for us, they're maintenance pages. They are pages that are uh, used to control the circuit breakers on this aircraft. And they are pages that are used to monitor uh, 
the aircraft systems and their health conditions. Whereas conventional fly decks have circuit breakers on the overhead panel or behind the pilot seat, in this fly deck you will find no circuit breakers. Circuit breakers are remote in electronic access panels and they are controlled remotely, digitally, via a circuit breaker via circuit breaker pages here on the synoptics display. The center screen uh, effectively a similar display unit as the primary flight display unit and the navigation display unit. Um, the lower display unit is normally used to present the CDU, the control display unit for the flight management system. I said they are physically interchangeable. In flight they are also interchangeable. If I would like to see the map display on the lower display unit, I can bring the map on the lower display unit and I can bring the CDU on the upper display unit. So if we lose functionality on one of the displays, there are still ways to move our information around, should we so need it. This display, this CDU, looks like a conventional CDU, but it is a computer image on a screen. It's not a touch screen. So these buttons here that are physical buttons on a conventional CDU have to be manipulated with a, with a cursor that we control with a cursor control device or in popular terms a trackpad. Now we both have our own cursor control device. I can't move my cursor control device to his screen, this stays on my screen. I can move it up to the upper screen And if I want to, I can uh, move it by uh, via a selection to the electronic flight bag. And now I've got it here on this screen. Um, on the EFB, it is uh, it's quite useful when we are looking into documents. The documents we have on this screen at the moment are. PDF files and for instance if we want to take a look into the minimum equipment list to look into uh, dispatch relief for certain malfunctions then it is quite useful to open the bookmarks and uh, find your way and navigate through that PDF file. Normally it works quite well with fingers but sometimes you want to uh, here we go you want to have a more precise way of uh, navigating on the page especially when you are using scroll bars and then sometimes it can be quite uh, useful to use the cursor control device on this uh, on this display as well move the cursor back to the navigation display it has a function here as well um, before I explain that, let us have another look at that fuel synoptics page I mentioned earlier. Here you see that the center fuel is now being scavenged. The wing tanks have uh, dropped below 16 tons and the fuel system is scavenging fuel from the center tank into the wing tanks. It also has a function on the navigation display. Here we have a feature which is a uh, called pick waypoint where we can select any waypoint on the navigation display. If we select an existing position it will recognize it as that existing position. Here we have 52 North 50 West as part of the most southerly net track today. I can select it and then that will bring it up into the CDU scratch pad. Um, 
but I can also select any position on the screen and then it will bring the lat long coordinates of that position to the scratch pad and that position I can now use and for instance place in the fix page and now it is a fix on the screen I can also enter it in the legs page if I want to design a route around a thunderstorm for instance I could use that however on uh, flights over the North Atlantic while we are in MNPS we generally don't put these positions in our legs routing because that will uh, frustrate the uh, interpretation by air traffic control like I said we are a CPA DLC so any modification is going to trickle down uh, on the screen with air traffic control uh, immediately afterwards so we don't want to alarm them because we are designing a, a routing around a thunderstorm if we want to navigate around thunderstorms we uh, we do use this uh, this feature in, com in combination with the fix page for instance so our routing today is quite northerly we have a ground distance of uh, 4,164 nautical miles with a average headwind of six, 17 knots. So the air distance is 4,326 nautical miles, whereas the Great Circle is only 3,747 nautical miles, which means that we that our ground distance traveled is 11% more than the great circle distance and still we're flying a random route so we could have flown any direct any route but still this is the most optimum route today and that has a lot to do with the uh, wind across the North Atlantic we started here in Amsterdam and then uh, overflew London, the south of Ireland, and now we're getting close to Newfoundland, St. John's here on the uh, eastern uh, point of uh, Newfoundland. There's a lot of headwind here in the Shenwick area. This is the Shenwick controlled portion of the North Atlantic. This bit here is the portion controlled by the Canadians, Gander and in a while we'll enter the part that is controlled by New York. Now the Great Circle would be somewhere around here. It would still be a curved line because of the projection of this map, but it would be a lot further to the south. And as you can see there is a very strong field of, uh, of headwind here as well. The alternative would be to pick a route more to the south towards Santiago here in Spain, but even there is a lot of headwind. So apparently this is still the uh, most optimum route. And although there's a lot of headwind on the first part of the crossing, uh, once we are steering inbound Bermuda and after Bermuda, we are expecting to, to pick up a considerable tailwind. But nevertheless, um, it is a quite long route for this uh, flight from Amsterdam to St. Martin. You may have picked up by now that there's three of us in the fly deck, where it is normally a fly deck that is operated by two pilots. And we are with a third pilot because of the length of our duty day today. We are doing, we're flying to two destinations, St. Martin and Curaçao, that combined with a turnaround uh, gives us uh, a little or no margin on the flight duty period limitations. Therefore, we have a third flight crew member in the flight deck. That allows me to take a little rest. So I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of my colleagues, Seb and Patrick. Talk to you later. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm Patrick. I just did the takeoff out of Amsterdam. I'm relief pilot uh, for this flight to St. Martin and Curaçao. And our part is taking a nap now for uh, two and a half hours. Um, so I'm uh, going to do uh, some of the talking.
Yeah, all right. So we uh, received the uh, comp system message. It's not an ATC message anymore because we had an ATC uplink already, which we accepted. And now we have the conditional clearance condition is met because it's uh, 1418 at this moment. So at 1418, the message pops up. And now we can contact uh, Gander Center on uh, VHF. Um, you can see on the um, on the com box here that there's an uplink with the uh, frequency as well. So we can just transfer the frequency like this. Let's see if we can uh, get in contact with Gander. Gander, good day. Orange 393, flight level 400 at uh, position 50 west. Arc fly 393, again, it's going to get eight, squawk 2572. 2572 on the squawk, Orange 393. Uh, my apologies, Orange 393. Roger, and I get a slight change to your routing uh, when you're ready to copy. Uh, step by one, uh, no problem. And Orange uh, 393 is ready to copy. Orange 393, clear presentation direct thought to Bravo Oscar, Bravo Tango Uniform. Direct 39 North, 6 Hero West. Direct to GCAL, Golf, Echo, Charlie, Alpha, Lima. And then remain near your flight plan routing is unchanged. Okay, Orange 393 is cleared direct to BOP2, 39 North, 6 Zero West, GCAL, and then flight plan route. Roger, and you are radar identified. Thank you, sir. Four November Alpha Victor descend flight level four three zero. Mm, we just uh, received a different uh, clearance than uh, than our previous clearance because we had the Oceanic clearance up to uh, Sapri. Uh, we now get a re-clearance again, uh, which uh, brings us direct from present position to Bob two, and then uh, from Bob two it's uh, to three nine north six zero west, which was already in the. Uh, in our routing, and then we go direct to GCAL so we can skip the positions Baloo and Bermuda. Yeah, do you agree? So, on a bigger range, we can see that we fly Bob to 39 North 6 Hero West, and then we skip the position Baloo and we skip the position Bermuda. Uh, which is uh, actually perfect because this is more flying in a direct line than going uh, from left to right, so that's excellent. So now we get rid of the uh, comp system message. Are you able to cancel? Because there was another pling and there's still an ATC message uh, on the ICAS uh, screen. Uh, this comp system message, ATC com established with Gander Domestic in this case. Have to cancel? We are uh, 6 hours and 17 minutes in the flight now uh, towards St. Martin. I'm um, going to explain you a little bit out about, the, uh, about the flight plan that we use during the flight and uh, which we use during the uh, pre-flight of the uh, flight today. Just put it in the middle so you can uh, watch it as well. You've seen uh, the front page um, in the uh, pre-flight, in the briefing, in the crew room. Uh, which has all the uh, relevant information uh, which we need uh, to decide on uh, how much fuel we uh, take on today's flight. Important in the, um, on the front page actually is uh, the, uh, the flight from Amsterdam to uh, St. Martin. Um, then uh, the, uh, the aircraft registration, Bob Hotel Tango Fox Mike, which is the plane that we are using today. It's uh, ETOPS certified, 180 minutes, 1200 nautical miles. Over here there's a uh, flight plan remark, which is uh, entered by the uh, dispatcher. Our flight plans are uh, being uh, computed in uh, Hanover. It's a random route today, outside the uh, organized track system. 
We have a mail item, uh, which is the forward cargo cooling compressor, which is also on the uh, status page. This moment the forward cargo cooling uh, system is uh, is not cooling, it's heating, but it's not cooling. At Amsterdam we have uh, received an ATC clearance, which we uh, write down on the flight plan. It's an runway 24, Falcon 1, share our departure, the squawk 2110, and the uh, next frequency for uh, to report ready for start and push. This is the routing uh, towards St. Martin uh, in FMS language for the flight management uh, system. Uh, this, is, this is the routing that we have entered into the uh, CDU, and which is the aircraft is uh, flying in the LNAP mode. This is a calculation of uh, the total fuel that we need today. Uh, there's a trip fuel towards St. Martin of uh, 43,647 kilograms with a flight time of 9 hours and 8 minutes. We need 3% contingency fuel based on Bermuda. We need some alternate fuel to fly to uh, St. John's of 28 minutes. Final reserve of half an hour gives us uh, 1,858 kilograms of fuel. This all added up it gives us a minimum takeoff fuel of uh, 49,127 kilograms. And we can fly 10 hours and 27 minutes with that. But we also need some taxi fuel. Taxi fuel is uh, a standard of 250 kilograms from the gate towards the uh, runway. So this is the minimum required, all added up. Minimum required of 49.4, which we need to go to St. Martin. As discussed earlier in the uh, briefing in the crew room, uh, we are adding some extra fuel. So we don't need to fuel at St. Martin. Uh, so 5,300 kilograms extra, and then there's a fuel on board. The total fuel on board is calculated on uh, 54,677 kilograms. And we can fly with uh, that amount of fuel 11 hours and 53 minutes. We've decided to take a little bit of extra fuel uh, because we have the APU running at St. Martin and it's using about 200 kilograms an hour and otherwise we uh, are just below the uh, minimum required for the second sector which is 10.7 uh, on the other flight plan, 10.7 from St. Martin to Curaçao. Then during the flight we're doing um, some fuel checks. Um, we have here all the uh, information of the uh, different waypoints. The minimum safe altitude at those waypoints, and uh, you can say for a Kenneth, the minimum safe is 024, so that's uh, 2400 feet. And the planned flight level is uh, flight level 380, 38,000 feet. Over here you see the, uh, the times, which is calculated by SEP. Uh, you see the uh, distance and the uh, amount of time that is needed to, uh, to cover the distance. So we're just adding uh, the uh, one minute to the previous one. So from 34, one minute is 35. And then from 35, one minute again, 36. And so we calculate that for the whole flight plan based on the actual uh, take of time. Then en route, uh, we fill in the uh, estimated time overhead, which is in this case for uh, Lamborn. Um, the flight plan is uh, calculated to fly overhead uh, at uh, 3 niner, and that's actually 0 niner, 3 niner, Zulu time. And then uh, during the flight, the FM, uh, FMS was calculating that the estimated uh, time of uh, flying overhead that waypoint is uh, 4 zero. Uh, in the meanwhile we had a direct towards uh, Compton so we didn't have an actual time overhead but for instance at Compton the calculated time was 4 seven the calculated time by the FMS was 4 seven and the actual time overhead was 4 seven and over here if you can read my uh, scribbling on the side the uh, required, uh, the fuel on board should be 49.0 and the fuel at uh, waypoint Compton was uh, 49.7. So we have an extra fuel of uh, 0.7700 kilograms on that waypoint. 
So we uh, write down the uh, fuel uh, at every waypoint, or in some waypoints, every hour more or less, uh, just to check if we have uh, enough fuel and if the fuel is still uh, enough to fly to uh, St. Martin and to rule out any uh, fuel leakage. What we also uh, write down on the flight plan are the HF frequencies. Here's the New York frequencies, 13306 is uh, the primary frequency, number one, and the secondary, 89006. We write those down just in case we uh, lose them in the uh, communication box or um, if we uh, change crew. There's always a backup and we always know uh, where to find the f next frequencies for uh, New York in case um, you know, the other pilots need them. So if we get that direct, uh, for instance, we were uh, flying uh, direct to 60, uh, 390 North, 60 West. Uh, we requested the direct uh, with New York to fly, fly direct GCAL. Uh, so we know that on the flight plan like this, GCAL. We can get from the uh, FMS the uh, calculated uh, estimated time overhead is 1643 for GCAL. So we can write that down. Four, three. So there's only two minutes uh, behind the uh, flight plan, and it's not too bad actually after all those uh, reroutes, uh, because in the beginning of the uh, flight we were about six minutes behind. Here the calculated was uh, 1412, and the uh, estimated time overhead was uh, 1419, so that's uh, seven minutes difference. So we're back to two minutes now, so that's quite good. Hi guys, I am the uh, second first officer today on this flight towards uh, Sint Maarten and Curaçao. My name is Zep. I've been with the company for uh, four years now, and this is the first year on the uh, 787. As you can see, we are seven hours away from Amsterdam, so we have some time spare. So let me tell you something about the overhead panel of this uh, Boeing 787 aircraft. First thing, you see if you uh, take a glance at the uh, overhead panel, yes, there are no circuit breakers. On a conventional aircraft, you would see all those CBs on the upper part of the uh, overhead panel, but this is now all electronically. So. I'll take you through the overhead panel on the left top side. You can see uh, two flight control services switches. Those are for maintenance. So we as a pilot, we, uh, we don't touch them. We start our pre-flight procedures actually with the uh, aligning of the IRSs. As you can see here, we have a left IRS switch and a right IRS switch. If you take a look at the whole panel, you can mainly divide it into four sections. And this is uh, the first row, that is the electrical side. The second side, as you can see, is the hydraulic side. The third side is the fuel side. And the fourth side is the air side. So if you're looking for a switch, you roughly know where you have to be in which area on the overhead panel. So, let me continue this uh, pre-flight uh, scan. On the ground, we make sure the battery is on. This will initially initiate the uh, alignment of the uh, left CCR. CCR is a common computing resource. That's basically the heart of the uh, 787. It allows uh, to put up a network for all the uh, data exchange with all the computers we have on board of this aircraft. As soon as we have a second uh, power source, the right CCR will come online and then the whole network is available. So we continue with the electrical. You can see APU generators, they're always on. On the ground, we have the forward external power switches, left and right, and aft we have also a connector, the aft external power connector. 
There below, here we can see the four uh, generator control switches. They're all closed in the they're all guarded in a closed position, so we only use them in a non-normal event. Coming down along, we have a triangle here that's the, for the captain. We see some uh, wipers, a HUD display. At the moment, as you can see, it's uh, inoperative. Then we come here on the second row. We have a small towing panel. We actually, on a daily basis, we don't need that. We don't use that panel. So I cannot tell you really interesting things about it. Then we come down to the CCR part I told you a little bit about. Basically the heart of the 787. Coming down is the uh, window heat. We have six switches and we make sure they're all in the on position. Here you can see a uh, ram air turbine switch. It will make sure that uh, in a non-normal situation, for example a dual engine failure, we have an uh, extra ram air turbine that will pop out of the fuselage and provide with uh, some electrical and hydraulically, uh, hydraulic power for us to power uh, essential systems. Coming down we see the hydraulics, like Bart, our captain, told us today a little bit about the hydraulic system. We have uh, two engine driven pumps, primary. We have some demand pumps, left and right. And in the center system we have uh, two electrical pumps, the C1 and the C2. Well, this is the passenger seatbelt signs. We put them on in case of any turbulence and on ground when the seatbelt sign has to be fastened. Here, I'll come back to you later. This is actually the lighting panel. Coming back on top on the third row, we see here a ground uh, knob. This is actually used by maintenance people. If they need to change anything about the system via the computer, they put this switch from normal into enable, and that will give access to the 787 software database. Here we can see the APU uh, fire discharge uh, switch. We use that in case it's uh, illuminated or when the uh, memory items have to be completed. If you want to push this switch, uh, it will automatically be released by the non-normal, but if not, you can see an knob behind the switch, you can press it in and it will enter, it will release the interlock behind it. So you can always pull it out and that will make sure the bottle is armed and if you turn it, it will discharge a fire bottle into the APU area. So coming further down, as you can see, we have two start knobs, two start switches. We used that earlier on at Amsterdam to start the right engine and the left engine simultaneously. Furthermore, we can see the uh, fuel jettison panel. This uh, aircraft is capable to uh, jettison fuel. And there's a small note, nice to know. We cannot uh, jettison fuel with a flaps 30 setting. Basically, we can pull this knob turn it and we can select a amount of fuel which we would like to stay on board and then press the nozzles and it will dump the fuel until the amount of fuel which we would like to have and it will automatically shut off. So here we can see the uh, fuel pumps. We have six, two left, two right and two for the center tank and the center tank is uh, already empty so they're off as you can see. We have the ability as well to uh, cross-feed between the tanks, left and right, and to balance uh, fuel tank fuel in case we have an imbalance. But we will have a message on the ICAS panel. Then we can see the anti-ice section. It's uh, divided into wing anti-ice and some uh, engine anti-ice, left and right. It's basically always on auto. Coming up on the uh, fourth row, we can see the ELT, it's the emergency locator transmitter. We just make sure it's in the uh, armed position and guarded. Here we can see the forward cargo temperature selector, forward position and the cargo position forward. As you can see, it's uh, been told a couple of times today it's uh, in up and we can see the amber light 
off. Then we have here the air conditioning panel. It consists of uh, flight deck temperatures and cabin temperatures. We have some recirculation fans for more efficient uh, air flows and equipment cooling. The left pack and the right pack and some trim air. Here we can see the pressurization area. It's as well um, all automatic. It's uh, normally not used by the pilots. But in case you need to use it, there are two options here to select manual to open the outflow valve or close the outflow valve when needed. And here, this is the same side as the captain. I can adjust my HUD brightness and I can use the wiper. So on the left side of the uh, wiper, we come here below the line. We have uh, the light section and actually on the top, you can see all the uh, flight deck lights we can adjust uh, here. Outside light, there's uh, landing lights, nose lights, runway turn off lights, taxi lights and strobe lights. And here you, we can find the beacon lights, navigation lights, logo lights, which we use at night to uh, illuminate the tail of the airplane. When it comes to approach preparations, there are two ways for us to do it. Um, basically, the pilot flying can do his own approach preparations, but as he'll, he'll be uh, distracted by the CDU for a longer period of time, we then ask him to transfer the controls to the other pilot. Or he can keep control of the aircraft and ask the pilot monitoring to do the programming for him. And that's how it's done on many occasions on, this, on, on our division, on the 787 within TUI. We find it has an added ad an advantage, being that as the pilot monitoring programs the arrival and approach procedure for the pilot flying, it automatically generates discussion on how you want to adapt or tweak the approach path if that is needed. And then you actually will have already done part of the briefing, as you have discussed the arrival routing together. And it becomes an interactive process to prepare for the approach for your destination. So you've selected the RNF-10 with a Uluba 1 arrival and a yes. Trinky transition. It looks like this. Sound 1, Orange 3, Niner 3, squawking 2723, maintaining level 410. Bobby, come on, try again. Hello, sir, it's the Orange 3, Niner 3, squawk 2723. And Orange 393, squawk 4417. 4417, Orange 3, three. From the MDA upwards, there is a glide path of three degrees. Hey, firm. On the second leg space, we see a glide path angle of three degrees. So that's from the MDA upwards to 1,700 feet, and then there is another glide path of three degrees from 1,700 feet upwards. Hey, firm. So that means we can intercept the final approach path from 2,600 feet. Hey, firm. And we will be flying this approach in Iyama. Agreed. Yeah? Yes. South of St. Martin there is an island with some obstacles of a little over uh, 3,000 feet, which brings the minimum sector altitude at 4,100 feet all the way around. Check. So since it's going to be a GNSS approach to 1-0, flown in Eon, we have to check the RNP in the position page. We have to make sure that GNSS updating is on. Yeah. So the RNP for the approach is programmed at 0.3. All right. Yeah. And 
on the position rep. We can see position update is armed. And the actual is 003, RMP at the moment 4, but it will go down to 0.3. And GPS nav is selected on. Wonderful. Fantastic. Okay. So that's the routing for the approach. Um, performance. Can you look into the landing performance for me? Yes. And if we select a flap sturdy landing with auto spoilers, all re reversers operating, NTI is off, no non-normal, and a manual landing, it provides the following uh, auto brake setting, recommended of four. Yeah. And that is calculated for a wet runway. Affirmative. Okay. So, I'll tell you what, we'll take auto brakes four. Yep. Yeah. Auto brakes four set. Thank you. And can you redo a calculation with auto brakes four to see what uh, brake cooling time we're gonna expect? Sure. With the ground cooling four. of 22 minutes. Yes. Nice. Nice. Okay. So auto brakes four it is then. And flap sturdy. Can you set the V ref for flap sturdy for me? Yep. Um, you agree with one five nine er as a landing weight? We uh, yeah. Take yeah. Can we go for a flap sturdy? It's set. V ref one thirty eight. That will give us a V final approach speed of one forty three. And the MDA of 700 feet had a go-around speed restriction of 205. So if we maintain this speed until we're inbound, uh, that position on bed, that's going to be uh, just fine. Sure. Right? Sounds like a plan. Okay. Then as for the briefing, I'll do a recall. The only message on the screen is the cargo AC air conditioning forward, which we know of, which is in the MEL. Yep. Otherwise, we have a fine aircraft. Uh, NOTAMs, did you see anything in the NOTAMs for St. Martin? Like, no, I cannot recall no. any uh, NOTAMs for St. Martin. Okay. The weather we've just looked at, wind from the east, nine knots. And clouds view at 2,200 feet. Visibility is nearly unrestricted, so that's nice. Um, we've just discussed the routing. After landing, we have to continue to the end of the runway. Make a 180 at the end of the runway. Yeah. We are not allowed to make a 180 turn at the intermediate turning pad. I see. That's all in the uh, in the airfield notes. Also, we have to take exit. Thank you, man. Also, we have to take exit Charlie. And according to the company pages of St. Martin, taxiway Bravo is closed. All right. Uh, where have I got that? In the meantime, I see an FMC message. Yeah. MCP altitude is set to cruise altitude, set lower altitude to enable VNOV descent. Yeah. Let's do that. Bye for descent. Three nine or three, the Senate goes to the main tank for level one nine zero. Roger, descending, flight level one nine or zero, orange three nine or three. Flight level one nine or zero is set up. Checked. Okay, it says here that we have to take taxi taxiway Charlie only. Down one four three four for the tier for level one four zero. So that's what we'll do. Yep. Right at 771 from. 
Since they have no uh, radar on St. Maarten, yeah. they usually ask some uh, radial versus distance from the VOR. Okay. So we have put that in the uh, fixed space. In the fix. Fine. Yeah. Very nice. Do we have any threats and errors on this uh, airfield? No. Well, for us it's a new destination. By a captain pilot flying. All briefed. Yeah. It's a short Our runway. Performance uh, limited on the runway. It's a short runway and there are multiple obstacles on the island. Yes. So if we make a missed approach procedure, we really have to focus on that turn to the missed approach point of on-bed. Exactly. Uh, also, it's a busy airport with a lot of general aviation traffic and smaller aircraft, smaller commuter aircraft. Um, so we have to keep a decent lookout. Okay? Yes, okay. Anything else? Anything I missed? Anything you want to add? No, it's a clear. Yeah. Clear plan, yes. Patrick, have you got anything to add for this one? No? Okay. Fine. We've just done the recall. Um, can you see if we have got any notes? Uh, on the checklist? No, we don't. Procedure no. is done. Then the descent checklist, please. Descent checklist. Rico. Is checked. Checked. Notes. Checked. Checked. Auto brake. Four. Landing data. BRF 3138. Minimums are Barrow 700. VRF 30138, minimums Barrow 700. Approach briefing. Completed. Descent checklist complete. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have started our descent into St. Martin and we've just picked up the latest weather details. The weather looks fine. Wind is light to moderate from the east. Visibility is nearly unrestricted and they have reported a few clouds overhead. The field temperature is 29 degrees centigrade. We expect to be landing in St. Martin a little under 30 minutes from now at uh, 20 minutes past 2 local time. We'll be landing towards the east and from this point on we'll be busying ourselves with the approach and landing into St. Martin. So for those of you who are leaving us here in St. Martin, I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant stay here on the island. We have to four, three, four, 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 for the return or next trip. Thank you for flying with us, and bye-bye. Hello, Sanctuary Hotel, Harry Taiwan Center, Squad 1301. Would like the ICOS on your side, Bart? Yeah, that's fine. That'll, uh, yeah, thank you. Marking 835, San Juan to center right, clear to right, Vino, San Juan. Okay, Orange 393. Orange 393, go ahead. Orange 393, contact San Juan Center, 11815. 11815, Orange 393, goodbye. San Juan Center, Orange 393, descending flight level 190, inbound Trinky. Okay, flight 393, San Juan Center, cross Trinky, flight level 090, and maintain level 090. Roger, descending uh, flight level 090 to cross Trinky, flight level 090, Orange 393. 090 is set, set. Checked. Arca flight 393, in the event of lost communication, in the event of lost communication at Trinky, contact Juliana 118.7 at Trinky. Hold. We have also adopted in our crew concept the procedure that the pilot monitoring calls out all the FMA changes. 
what the autopilot is really doing. We can select all these modes here on this mode control panel for the autopilot, but if it doesn't show here on the flight mode annunciator, then it hasn't kicked in or hasn't activated. And previously the pilot flying would call out the FMA changes and now we have adopted the concept where the pilot monitoring calls out all FMA changes regardless of all his other tasks. And what that gives us, we have found, is that it gives us a better monitoring from the pilot monitoring. Speed Venus Pub. Check. Orange 3937 with a frequency check. Radio 5 out of 5, so Orange 3903. Thank you. Juliana Tower, good day, Orange 3903, descending level 090 inbound trunky. Orange 3903, after trinky, turn right and proceed direct to Utmut for the INAV approach on way 10. Altimeter 29901, wind 120 degrees at 8 knots, descend and maintain 2,600 feet. Roger, descending altitude 2,600 feet on the QNH 29901, after position trunky right towards Utmut for the RNF 10 at St. Martin. Orange 393. Orange 393, correct. Do we have to maintain the level 9-0 restriction at Trinky? Hey, Juliana Tower for the orange 3 9 3 Do we need to uh, comply with the restriction 9 0 at Trunky? Confirm your level now. We are now passing flight level 100. Uh, okay, we can continue your descent to 2,600 feet. Roger. Continue your descent altitude 2,600 feet, orange 3 9 3 2,600 is set. And I'll reselect. Check. QNH 29901. And passing altitude 9,600 feet. Okay. Approach checklist. QNH Hey, Juliana Tower, confirm uh, Orange 393, we are cleared for the air nav approach 10. We're just about to call you, cleared our nav approach runway 10, report of Aki. Flap 1. Wilco, cleared for the uh, RNF approach, runway 10, Orange 3903. Thank you. Five. 
I'm expecting light path at eight miles from the runway. I'm from the triple alpha clip, taxi. Big Baba Alpha 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 A firm, taxi low and point alpha hold shot. Alpha hold, to hold. Left 648 on the ground time 16881 revive taxi with Delta. Charter Delta 648. Orange 3903 over position. Alpha, left there. Orange 3903, runway 10, clear land 100 degrees 9 knots. Clear land runway 10, over Orange 3903. Gear down, left 20. Alpha, 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 expedite to Bravo, and you can expect departure to Bravo. Check. 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 Kevin, ready? Check. Victor Alpha, 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 Alpha from Bravo, runway 10, clear takeoff, 090 degrees at uh, 9 knots. Clear takeoff, runway 10. And caution with the cranes and mass on an outside of runway. Orange uh, 393, caution with those two sailing vessels uh, south of the uh, approach center line. I'm not quite sure what their intentions are. Roger, we have them inside. Orange 393. Got it. Landing checklist. Landing checklist complete. Checklist complete. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Juliana, Bound Air 8101. See those two sailing boats? Bound Air Juliana. 8101, 5 miles from uh, Lugo, level 9 or 0, squawk king 4604. Mountain 8101, after Lugo. And it seems uh, they you are... Can direct you, Luba. Standby for descent, altimeter 2991. Check. Check. After Lugo, direct you, Luba, 48101. Not moving, but they are heading north, north uh, next to no speed. Uh, 8101, uh, can you give me the uh, uh, spell to Luba for me? Uniform Lima, Uniform Bravo Alpha. It's hard to tell, but I think I'm looking at two whites, two red. Uh, on one three zero, Good speed 124, okay. clear direct to same bar, altimeter 29901. 2991, direct same bar, good speed uh, 121. Manual flight. Juliana, good speed 105 Alpha. Check. Good speed 105 Alpha confirmed. 1000. Hey firm, good speed 105 Alpha departing same part uh, to San Juan. Good speed 105 Alpha. Uh, remain outside of the control zone, altimeter 2991, wind uh, 110 degrees at 7 knots. Report minimums. passing 125, climate at 165. Company traffic opposite direction at the 130 will be descending shortly. Inside the uh, control zone and report back 125 or 165, good speed, 105 alpha, look for traffic. Mountain 8101, descent. Check. Uh, Mountain 8101, I'm showing one mile from uh, Blue Room. Got it. The uh, good speed uh, 105, uh, correction, uh, good speed 124, position. Uh, just past Blue Girl, uh, you told us direct same bus, good speed 124. Hey, firm, I know I told you direct same bus, I need your. DME, sir. DME, 32 DME, Papa Julius, 9 cruise speed, 124. And good speed, uh, 124. Uh, just had a technical 30. issue. Say again, uh, the distance. 10. Okay, uh, DME is 30. Papa Julius, 9 cruise speed, 124. Good speed 124, I will continue to send 100. 100 and direct same bars, good speed 124. Correct. QSY for the ship level. 
Pick up Alpha, 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 load on 18-5. Brakes are cancelled. The uh, Tango Fox shot Lima, orange shot uh, 393 on the ground time at time 21, 180, big keep running by taxi, Charlie. Take anything uh, on the right via uh, Charlie, uh, orange 393. You see that mountain peak? Yeah. You see that peak? Yeah. And in between, that's a saddle. Yeah. In the description of the departure profile, they mention a saddle that you have to fly through, and that's a saddle. Juliana Tardy in Tel Aruba 531. In Tel Aruba 531, heard. Uh, current weather conditions. Altimeter is uh, 299 at 1, the wind is 120 degrees at 7 knots. Oh, and the temperature is 298. It's frequency 127, decimal 65. 2765, now we had that, we just wanted to use current wind conditions, check and see if we could take runway 28 for departure. Roger. Uh, Any chance? Traffic permitted. Yes. Roger, on request, then would like to activate our flight plan to uh, 10 1. Uh, correction to 10 other means. Roger, your clearance is on request. Thank you, sir. Julian, Aircraft, 5 Papa Jude, Whiskey, Aqua Alpha, down in runway 10. Aircraft, I have Five alpha passing level. Landing checklist. Checklist complete. Checklist complete. Checklist complete. Yep. Manual flight. Clear on good speed. One zero five alpha. Check. Good speed 105 Alpha confirmed. 1000. Hey firm, good speed 105 Alpha departing St. Park uh, to San Juan. Good speed 105 Alpha. Uh, remain outside of the control zone. Altimeter 2991, wind uh, 110 degrees at 7 knots. Report minimums. passing 125, climate at 165. Company traffic off the direction at the 130 will be descending shortly. Minimums. Inside the uh, control zone and report Continue. passing 125 or 165. Good speed 105 Alpha, what's the traffic? Mountain 8101, distance? Check. Uh, Mountain 8101, I'm showing one mile from uh, Lugo. Roger. The uh, good speed 105, uh, correction now, uh, good speed 124, position? Uh, just past Lugo. Check. Uh, you told us the direct same price, good speed 124. Hey, I know I told you the direct same price, I need your DME, sir. DME, 32 DME, Papa Julius, good speed 124. Speed uh, 124, uh, just had a technical 30. issue. Say again, uh, the distance. Yeah. Okay, uh, DME is 3-0. Papa Juliet Mike, good speed 124. Good speed 124, I continue descend 100. 100 and direct 10 bars, good speed 124. Correct. Curious fly for the ship level. Pick it up Alpha, 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 load on 18-5. Brakes are cancelled. The uh, Tango Fox shot Lima, orange shot 393 on the ground time at time 2-1, 180, they keep running by taxi, Charlie. Juliana Tardy, Intel Aruba 531. Intel Aruba 531, good. This is from the uh, current weather conditions. Altimeter is uh, 299 at 1, the wind is 120 degrees at 7 knots. And the temperature is 298. It is frequency 127, decimal 65. 
765, no, we had that. We just wanted to hear current wind conditions, check and see if we could take runway 28 for departure. Roger. Uh, Any chance? Traffic permitted. Yes. Roger, on request, and would like to activate our flight plan to uh, San Juan. Uh, correction to San Domingo. Roger, your clearance is on request. Thank you, sir. Julian aircraft, let's get Papa Jude, Whiskey Echo Alpha, join down in runway 10. Echo Alpha, I have information. Whiskey 105 Alpha, passing level. Delta 908, after Slugo, descend to flight level 120, and after Slugo, request direct to Baki. Third is requested, Delta 908. Third is requested, Delta 908. Orange 393, confirm, Baki. Orange 393, the uh, parking is going to be at Alpha 3. Check. How are we doing on that side? Clear? Papa Jude, Whiskey Echo Alpha, runway 10, clear land, 120 degrees at 8 knots. Clear land, Echo Alpha. Thank you. Juliana, Mountain 8105, over Slugo. Mountain 8105, Juliana. Right now, over Slugo, walking 3. Well, that was the approach, uh, arrival and landing in St. Martin. With two sailing vessels on short final, I was not quite sure where they were going. Initially, I thought they were going to stay south of the center line, but they were slowly crossing our center line on short final. Um, that brought me above the glide path a little bit. Um, that was later re-intercepted. Um, and, well, we calculated the landing performance for a wet runway but in fact the runway was still dry, so we came to a nearly standstill uh, just uh, beyond uh, the mid runway, mid run midpoint of the runway. Um, and this is it. Welcome to St. Martin.